Sports Beat is brought to you by Ken Gart. We hear you. Sports Beat is live. We hope you have enjoyed your 4th of July weekend. Sam and JJ with you for the next 45 minutes. The Utah Jazz leave for Orlando on Tuesday. But before they do, we hear from eight members of the team, including Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. Yeah, a month ago, Utah defensive coordinator Morgan Scally, he was suspended after discovering that a racial slur was used in a text message in 2013. Well, this week, he was reinstated. You'll hear his apology and the punishment that Utah is giving him coming up later on. But first, let's get started with some of those live sports. The PGA Tour, $1.3 million going to the winner today at the Rocket Mortgage Classic in Detroit. Tony Finau had his best round of the tournament yesterday, shooting six under 66, the third lowest round of that day, but still eight shots behind the leader, Matthew Wolf. So here we go, final round. Today's round did take a turn for the worse for Tony. He would bogey holes one and two. He doubled on hole five, four over for the round before getting into a rhythm on the back nine. Here he is on the 17th green for his fourth birdie of the day, but he would finish two over for the round, tied for 53rd place in the tournament. How about Wolf? Well, how about this putt on the fourth green? Plenty of ground to cover, and he just, he does just that, covers it all. Nice putt, finished just uh, one under for the round, though, second place at 20 under. This was Bryson DeChambeau's day. Look at the movement on this birdie putt. Goes right, then left, and then back right into the cup. He also has some range on the greens. The long bird here is gonna drop to the bottom of the cup. He wins the Rocket Mortgage Classic by three strokes. Barrel delivers and scores! Magnificent! Now for Rodriguez. Rodriguez scores! Ball to Mewis. Mewis a chance! Watch his back post. And it's lob off the crossbar and in. Rising header! Gorgeous goal! What a great week of soccer. Utah is home to the NWSL's Challenge Cup. Games played at Zions Bank Stadium in Harriman all week. There were two more games. On Sunday, everyone continues to chase the North Carolina Courage, who are the class of the league. North Carolina dominating this tournament so far. Their victim Sunday, the Chicago Red Stars, 81st minute. The Courage on the attack. Abby Ursig off the crossbar, and that is all they would need. North Carolina wins 1-0, and they move to 3-0. Well, the Portland Thorns are fifth in the standings, taking on fourth place Washington Spirit today. Finally in the 69th minute, look at that. Lindsey Horan, the diving header. Thorns up 1-0 with that beauty. The lead only lasted eight minutes. In the 77th minute, you want to watch the heel flip right there from Ashley Sanchez. Sets up Sam Slab for the header. Draws the game even. What a flip. That's how it would end, though. 1-1. Utah Royals resume playing the Challenge Cup on Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. against Olympic Reign. The Royals picked up their first win of the tournament on Saturday, a 1-0 win over Sky Blue FC. Amy Rodriguez off the assist from Vero Boquette was the difference. In their Challenge debut on Tuesday, the Royals came back from 3-1 down with two goals in the final 10 minutes. That free kick by Vero Boquette and a header by rookie Ziara King. After two games, they're tied with Houston for second behind North Carolina. I think this team has a lot of spirit, a lot of fight. Um, even though we are kind of a new club this year with a lot of new players, new head coach, new system, um, we're in it for each other. And I think that shows, you know, greatly on the field. And the better performance that, that we can put out there, that's just a, a quality of chemistry and, and willingness to fight for each other. We had a, a little short time, and uh, now it's like during the tournament we have to grow like as a team, and uh, we are trying to do that. The players that are coming from the bench, they are doing a fantastic job. And, uh, yeah, the team spirit, and uh, we are really united, so uh, we are here playing for each other, and uh, that is what we're going to do during all the tournament. Here's play right there. Splits the defender out front. Drives inside. Show the rebound. Rudy maybe got a hand up on it. Clarkson. That's his spot. Bang. Straight away. Look. There was more of that. And Buckets gets the bucket. Yes, he does. He's inside. And that's how you finish. Oh, taken away. Take it to the rim. Pass Donovan. Just keeps the clock. Throws it down from way downtown. Boy, have we missed Utah yes. Jazz basketball. The countdown to the NBA restart continues. The Jazz take on the New Orleans Pelicans on July 30th in Orlando. That's just 25 days away. It's coming. The Jazz leave Tuesday for Orlando. The NBA announced the Jazz will have three scrimmages 
before then, July 23rd against the Suns, July 25th against the Heat, and July 27th against the Nets. I'm excited for the scrimmages even, yeah, right? See, seems like it's been forever <laughs> since the Jazz did last play, and a lot has happened in those four months without the NBA, including exposing a bit of a rift in the relationship between Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. Yeah, before they leave for Orlando, the Jazz have been working out at the practice facility. And we've had a chance to hear from multiple players as they prepare to enter the bubble in Orlando. And of course, the relationship between Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert is a question fans ask me about more than anything. So what is the latest between the two All-Stars? You know, right now we're good. We're going out there ready to hoop. Um, and I think the biggest thing, you know, that, that kind of sucked was that it took away from the guys on the team. No one expects it to be perfect, and it's never going to be perfect. I've never had a perfect relationships, you know, with, with my teammates or with even my family members or with pretty much anyone that's around me. But, you know, as going forward, you know, I think that'll be really the primary focus is just us gelling as a team because obviously you, Rudy, and I had COVID and whatever happened, happened. But, you know, now we're ready to hoop and focus on the team as, as a whole. As long as we respect one another and we we both share the same goals and we both do what's best for the team. Uh, that's what matters. Well, Rudy has been in the spotlight a lot since March and not all of the publicity has been positive. As we know, there was the positive test that came with, with all of that as well and those reports from the locker room drama with Donovan and other teammates. Now, earlier this week, he was asked if any of that caused him to rethink being with the Jazz. Would he leave? I'm really happy in Utah. Uh, you know, like I've always been saying, uh, I love living here. You know, so that's the number one thing. Number two thing, uh, I want to win. You know, so to be honest, as long as I feel like we we can win and, you know, and we have a group like Queen, the, the things we've been building over the years, it's something that you don't see anywhere else. Uh, and that's something I take a lot of pride in. I don't plan on, on leaving right now. Uh, I plan on winning a championship in Utah, and uh, and of course, you know things things evolve, things change. But as of today, uh, you know I don't even think about the extension or the money. I just think about you know uh, being healthy first, mentally, physically, and uh, and just go out there and uh, and try to do try to win. Rudy's uh, eligible for that supermax in the off season. The Jazz are about to enter in an unprecedented situation. Playing in a bubble in Orlando for several weeks during a pandemic is not something players agreed to in the collective bargaining agreement. It wasn't something negotiated in a contract. It would be understandable if players didn't want to go and opted out. But all healthy Jazz players are going. That doesn't mean, though, that there isn't some concerns. I mean, probably not still 100% kind of comfortable or, or anything. Um, I don't really think anyone would be... 100 percent we don't want to go down there if it's not safe and and in the nba has done everything they can to to make it as as, as zip you know zip tight as possible my biggest concern is the injury aspect you know and obviously there's contractual implications for myself as well that's that's no secret as well but you know we just you're going to use those games you know to build on what we have you know get comfortable get our rhythm going and then you know try to go as far as we can it's tough when you're relying on obviously not just yourself to be smart about things, but you're relying on so many other people. So um, not that I don't trust everyone, but it, it's just uh, a lot of it out of, is out of my control. Well, when the Jazz get to the bubble, Boyan Bogdanovich, he won't be there after undergoing season-ending wrist surgery. He'll be back in time for next season when that starts in December. But for now, the Jazz lose a player who averaged 20 points per game and is one of the best three-point shooters in the NBA. Can they make up for what Boyan brought to the team before his injury? You know, it's unfortunate that we don't have him. Uh, I do, you know, everybody understands that I think uh, that decision is, is the right one. Obviously, Boyan's going to be missed. He was a huge uh, piece of you know, our puzzle and of our, of our team. Um, but like I've said before, you know, coach kind of has that, um, you know, the strength of the team is the team uh, mentality. I think we got guys who like have the next man up mentality. So I think it's going to be all of us, you know, to take over and, you know, to try to incorporate in the offense and defense what he did. Anytime you lose a player, uh, whether it be the injury uh, or, you know, to foul trouble during the game, there's always, adjustments that that have to occur in this instance you know 
we haven't been able to feel those on the court. I think all of us are going to have to step up a little bit, but I understand my situation and, um, and you know, really I'm, I'm excited for it. I get opportunity to, um, you know, just play a, a role that I hadn't had to play so, so far this year. Um, yeah, I think it'll be a collective kind of effort, but um, in saying that, obviously he, he's still a big piece to, to miss going into this kind of last, whatever's going on from here on out. We'll have more from the Jazz in the 11 o'clock hour. Now the play of the day. It goes to Jawan Taylor of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Taylor is a 315-pound offensive tackle. Well, he caught a fish this week that outweighs him by 85 pounds. Yes, Taylor landed himself a 400-pound grouper off the coast of Jupiter, Florida. The grouper was released after the catch, but Taylor has the pictures to prove it. Wow, amazing. All right, let's dust the tapes off in the archive tonight for this gem in baseball. July 5th, 1989, Phillies outfielder Lenny Dykstra with the line drive single to right. Paul O'Neill for the Reds had trouble handling the ball, so you saw what he did there. Look, he just kicks it back to the infield. The kick was so good, it kept Steve Yeltz from scoring. O'Neill did go on to win five World Series rings in his career, so not too bad for him. He should have played soccer. <laughs> wow. How many of you remember that one? That was a pretty cool moment. All right, time for a short break. When we come back, we have more from the Jazz as they prepare to leave for Orlando. And Morgan Scally addresses his 2013 message that included a racial slur. Sports Beat is brought to you by Ken Garth. We hear you. Here we go. 30 more minutes of Sports Beat. Live sports are slowly returning. One of the first to make the comeback during, that pande during the pandemic has been NASCAR. Yeah, one of the top drivers was out this weekend at Brickyard, Jimmy Johnson. His wife tested positive for coronavirus. But the show goes on. Wild finish. At the Brickyard, Denny Hamlin leading just seven laps for victory, but he blows his right front tire and slams into the wall. He'd be okay, but Kevin Harvick would take full advantage of that, holding off Matt Kenseth after the restart. Harvick wins the Brickyard 400. It's his 53rd career victory. All right, the countdown continues. In just two more days, the Jazz will head to Orlando, where they will enter the NBA bubble for the remainder of the season. But the team we'll be seeing down there won't be the same as the one that we got used to watching from October through March. Yeah, key player will be missing. Boyan Bogdanovich is out. Someone needs to step up and make, for the 20, re, make up for the 20 points per game that the Jazz will be missing from their rotation. The first player the Jazz will look to to make up for the loss of Boyan is, of course, Mike Conley. Mike struggled to find his rhythm and consistency during the season, and, of course, injury was a factor in that. But can Mike correct that in Orlando? The Jazz need him to step up big. They're going to have success in the playoffs. I think this is a great opportunity for me. I think the, you know, having a break in between and just being able to sit back and take a step away and uh, and kind of evaluate and see what needed to be done differently and in different ways to get in a better rhythm and um, you know lock in and approach the game differently. I think it's it's huge for me. So I'm excited for that uh, and getting down there for that. But Orlando, you know, I have you know. This is a new, new situation for us all. I think um, it'll kind of bring us all back to, you know, our childhoods more than anything where we just, you know, it's summertime basketball, but yet it's, it's meaningful basketball at the same time, but we're just out there playing for the love of the game, really. You know, it's, it's, you just love to go out there and compete, and, um, you know, guys are going to have to do it without having their, you know, their normal routines at home. and. Um, normal recovery systems and schedules and regiments. This is going to have to be, you know, uh, something that we're all new in, and thrown into. And whoever can adjust to, you know, the uncomfortable, um, the different circumstances or um, the, this unusual, I think will we'll, we'll do the best. All right, leadership is going to be big for the Jazz, both on and off the court during this unprecedented situation in Orlando. Is Donovan Mitchell, a player that just finished or is finishing his third year in the NBA. Is he ready to continue in that role and step up even more as the Jazz face this new challenge? Donovan has kind of taken the front seat to the leadership role um, with this team and has grown every year. 
that he's been here in that role? No, just the part that he's taken in the community and then even on the court, you know, uh, you know, he's getting better. He wants everybody else getting better, you know, trying to lead by example, you know, just with using his platform and stuff like that. Some of it you guys don't see as much. Some of it we see on the floor. Some of it we see in the locker room. Some of it we see during video. He did a great job of making sure he checked in on everybody while everything was going on, whether if it was, you know, hopping on uh, FaceTime workouts, you know, over quarantine or, you know, just FaceTiming guys individual and ask, asking their certain opinions on, you know, racial issues. Uh, you know, he's really, you know, spearheaded that and, and been at the helm. I think it's really important that, you know, our leader and the guy that we look up to is so constant, you know, when it comes to doing uh, or consistent when it comes to doing the right thing. He's one of the guys I've, I've talked to, you know, if not every day, almost every day. Um, and, you know, that, those conversations have, had, have been wide-ranging. Um, some of them about our team, some of them are personal, some of them are societal. And, um, you know, Donovan's a very thoughtful person. Um, and that's, I think, that's what we're seeing. You know, you're seeing a, a, a young man who isn't as young as he was last year and uh, is growing and uh, will continue to do that. And, and uh, I'm just excited that he's on my team and I get a chance to coach him. Another concern some NBA players have about going to Orlando is will resuming the NBA season, will that cause people to lose focus on the discussion and the issues currently going on surrounding social injustice that have been on top of mind in country lately? The NBA is putting Black Lives Matter on the courts and allowing players to wear messages on the back of their jerseys in place of names in order to keep that in the spotlight. Donovan Mitchell, who has been vocal on these issues, addresses that question. It, it isn't an ideal situation for us to go play uh, right now, um, but we definitely are going there. Uh, I know a lot of players have agendas and uh, things that they want to put out uh, using the platform. Um, in Orlando. I think the PA and the league has done a great job of understanding putting the Black Lives Matter on, on the court. And that way it's at least aware. People, it's always on people's minds. It's gonna be right there, you know. But I think the one thing that does <clears throat> that 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 is unfortunate is that we can't be there on the front lines anymore helping out, you know, at least the teams that are in the bubble. So we have to do it not just as players, but as a as a as a as a league, we have to really make a statement. Um, we're working on a bunch of things that I, I can't really say right now, but I think there's a lot of things that are going to come out of us being down there in that bubble. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do wish, to be honest with you, I do wish that we were able to be there on the front lines as opposed to being in that bubble. I, and I, that's my personal opinion because I think that's just something that really needs attention. Yeah, a lot of fans will be anxiously watching and awaiting. Now, as you've already heard, Donovan Mitchell has been using his voice to address issues of racial injustice, both here in Utah and outside our state. He's specifically been vocal about the shooting of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, where he played his college basketball. Speaking out on these issues has led to criticism online from some people, including some jazz fans. Jazz players, they read some of those comments on Instagram. They should probably shut up and just, uh, you know, kind of, look at themselves in the mirror and kind of, if everybody's saying something, something's got to, you know, something's got to change. It's, 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 it's a problem that everybody is noticing. You know, I think it opened a lot of eyes, to be honest with you, when um, that post uh, came out and the comments and stuff. And it's easy for people to say, don't read them. It's tough when there's outrageous and, and, and crazy. And then you click on the C and it's not like they're bots, you know, as people call them. They're, they're people who, live not only here but in, in different places you know you gotta you gotta face it and you know once you go over that and once you feel that um you know you've you found you know something peace of mind or anything i feel like that's what a lot of people are searching for to be honest with you all right we need to take a short break when we come back the university of utah reinstates morgan scally his emotional apology is up next and we're getting you ready for the Jazz to restart by counting down Donovan Mitchell's top five playoff dunks. It's a short career, but they're great. That's coming up.
Utah defensive coordinator Morgan Scally will keep his job after an independent review into an incident from 2013 in which Scally admitted to using a racial slur in a text message. But there are consequences for his mistake. Scally and the university agreed verbally to a multi-year contract extension in December that increases annual compensation to $1.1 million. Now his new contract will revert to his old one, a one-year $525,000 contract. That's quite a pay cut. Athletic director Mark Harlan has also rescinded his title of head coach in waiting. Scally will also participate in regular diversity and inclusion education and will be expected to be a key partner in addressing issues of racism and bias in Utah Athletics Department, the university, and broader community. An emotional Scally spoke after the decision was handed down this week. I had the opportunity to address the full team yesterday morning and I expressed to them the complete embarrassment I feel for having hurt them and my fellow colleagues in any way. I've reached out to many of my former teammates, players, uh, to offer my apologies, but uh, have not had the opportunity of connecting with all of them. So, gentlemen, if you're listening, I apologize. Excuse me. I apologize. I'm particularly mindful of the young men of color whom I have had the blessing of coaching. I understand that my insensitivity and extreme lack of judgment has caused some, if not all of you, to lose trust and faith in me. I sincerely hope that you will give me the opportunity to gain that trust back. Former Utah defensive back Ryan Lacey spoke up and said he was the victim of a racial slur used by Scally when Lacey was a freshman a few years ago. Scally denied Lacey's allegation during the independent review. Lacey told Trevor Allen of KSLSports.com that Scally's denial was a flat slap in the face. I was upset and I, I felt like it was just a slap in my face to the truth. And I, you know, as a, a single father now, and you know, I'm using a degree that I was blessed to get from the University of Utah and working, I had nothing to gain from speaking my truth. Sadly, after speaking up about his experience, Lacey and his family have received threats, racial threats. This prompted the official Twitter of the University of Utah and AD Mark Harlan to publicly condemn the tr those threats, calling them repugnant. Moving on now, back to the NBA. If things go as planned in Orlando, we will have NBA playoff games in five weeks. Another chance for Donovan Mitchell to prove himself in the postseason. He seems to rise up to the occasion on that big stage. Yes, he's never missed the playoffs in his young career. And in two previous postseasons, he's dazzled us with some memorable dunks. So it's a perfect topic for a top five tonight. George stolen by Rubio. Rubio maintains his balance. Oh, what a feed. Mitchell, big finish. Woo, number five, 2018, Donovan throwing down with both hands against the Thunder, courtesy of the sweet dish from Ricky Rubio. You know, it's not easy to blow by Paul George, but you know what, Donovan made it look easy. What a playoff debut, what a series for Donovan against the Thunder in 2018. In 2019 against the Rockets, Donovan, the steal, and Jay Crowder sets him up for the rim rocker. That got everyone out of their seats at Vivint Arena. Stolen, O'Neal, Rob, Donovan! Oh my goodness, how did he do that? This just goes to show that Donovan Mitchell doesn't need the perfect lob pass to do something sensational. Just watch him go back and get that pass from Royce O'Neal and throw it down. This, of course, in a Game 4 win against the Rockets in 2019. We won't mention anything else about this series. Crossover, Mitchell into a reach. No! Oh! He came in hot going up high. And when you get that hot, you've got to come in hot. Oh, my God. Yes, the number one postseason dunk from Donovan Mitchell. Another than this beauty against the Rockets in his rookie season. A play on a national stage that really helped begin to launch that NBA stardom that he now enjoys. I'll tell you what, 
two postseasons, a lot of amazing dunks. It's pretty incredible. I was in the building when he threw that down. Oh man. And it, I had to, I just, I couldn't believe what I saw. I couldn't believe he bounced back up that quick and did it. <laughs> I had to look around. I was like, did that really just happen? Uh, we have the video proof right there. Yes, it did. Unbelievable. All right, well, this summer's Wimbledon championships were canceled earlier this year because of the coronavirus. Yeah, so tonight we're giving you an amazing Wimbledon moment, though. 45 years ago today, an unforgettable moment at the All England Club. 45 years ago today. All right, up next, Tom Hackett is taking us golfing again. Yes, he is. It's the latest edition of the Hallowed Grounds. And Utah linebackers coach Colton Swan is his lucky guest. You'll see it when we come back. The Hallowed Grounds, brought to you by Siegfried and Jensen. Welcome into this week's episode of The Hallowed Grounds. Ogden Golf and Country Club, as always, Colton Swan, everybody. Utah football linebackers coach, we're on the 10th hole. This is a par four. Fun little track. And uh, Swanee, this is how this thing works, right? If you beat me on this hole, we go to the next hole. If you hit it closest to the pin, this Bushnell wingman is all yours. If not, we won't let you leave empty-handed, courtesy of uh, Heba Golf uh, and or you into golf. So uh, absolutely, it's consider all yours, it a win my for me. I know free golf and, and <laughs> right. prizes. Uh, your tee box. You're right. I'm left. It's fair. The beauty of looking for a golf ball in the rough. Hey, do you mind informing people how you got to Utah? No, not at all. Just about how my path from Weber State and all the way up. Well, like, who was the first phone call you made? I think I called Tom Hackett well, the very hello. first one. I don't hello. Hello. <laughs> yep. And you give me a call. Absolutely. And you say you want to put a word in. I say, of course, would love to. Yeah. And I called, uh, I, I didn't call, I saw Coach Witt. And I said, I've got a coach that I want to recommend. He says, who is it? I said, Colton Swan. He goes, he's up at Weber. He goes, I don't want anyone from Weber. <laughs> I said, no, no, I promise, he's good. You'll love him, he's been up there forever. He goes, no, I don't want anybody from Weber. I want somebody that's had defensive coordinator experience. And in my head, I'm thinking, you aren't gonna find anyone. After the bowl game that year, I said, did you ever get a hold of Swanee? Yeah. He, uh, and I could tell it stung him a bit. Cause he didn't want to admit to me yeah. that I was right the whole right. time. Right. And he goes, he's meeting with Scally in, uh, in a couple days. Yeah. And then I tried calling you and you wouldn't answer because he told you not to tell anybody and I was the one that got you the damn Probably job. Probably because I didn't want to jinx anything. Not very! Uh -oh. he's, he's on what I call 36th Street. <laughs> I'm in trouble right now. Hey, would you call yourself a cowboy? I would consider myself, yes. But now you live in Morgan. Now I live up in Morgan. Yeah. How would you best explain to the people watching this show what Morgan's like? <laughs> well, for people that haven't been to Morgan, it's pretty small. How big? It's quiet, it's beautiful. I'll concede. I have to phrase the question correctly, but how would you best describe the culture at Utah football? I've been around six different head coaches, right? And the culture at Utah is one of the best I've ever been around. Uh, I think it's exactly what a team needs in order to win football games. Uh, it's a tough game. I mean, you know, I've both played it. Uh -huh. uh, I think you have to have that tough mentality, that mindset. And uh, if you don't preach it and you don't practice it and you don't work on it, then come Saturday, you're not going to have it. Uh, and that's what I think Utah football is all about. How about Washington Boulevard? That is on the road. <laughs> yeah, it was. Swanee, uh, although it wasn't your day, <laughs> we, uh, we had a blast as we knew we would. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, it's your choice. We can get you a foursome up to Heber Valley Golf. Okay. Or, uh, or a $100 gift card to you into golf. You don't have to make a decision right now. We can talk about that at a later date. In all seriousness, best of luck for the season. Uh, thank you. Love you dearly, and uh, thanks for coming up here on the show. Tom, thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure. Come Swan, everybody. All right, Patrick Fishburn, you saw him uh, play rather impressive. Hey, his strength, one of his many strengths, I should say, is uh, his driving ability. So, Patrick, in a minute or two, if you could just explain kind of your setup, some of the things you, th you think about when you step up on, on a tee box and um, 
and, and how you are able to generate so much power. Yeah, so the first thing I do when I'm looking at a tee shot, I try to pick a small target and so I'll, with this shot, I'll pick that tree in the distance and try to pick a really small target and focus in on that. If I look out there and just think hit fairway, then my miss is gonna be huge. And so what a lot of the people do that I think the guys that I play with, they hit down on the driver. Their angle of attack is down, which creates a lot of spin and a, a lot of dispersion in their shot. And so what I think about with the driver is hitting up on it. And the way I do that is I start with a little wider stance. And I put about 60% of the weight in my back foot, about 40 in my front foot. And then I just think about having a lot of width and a little pause at the top and just let it go. The other thing I will say quickly before we go is you, you tee the ball up quite high. Yeah. I feel like in comparison to most people I play with, granted, I think you're the first pro I've ever played with. Do most pros tee it up as high as you do? I think so. It just depends on the shot you want to hit. If I want to, if there's a wide open hole that I just want to send one, then I'll tee it as high as I can and just try to launch it as high and far as I can. But if it's a narrow shot or something that I just want to get one in play, I'll tee it down and kind of hit a, a punch cut type of shot. So it kind of depends on the hole. That's cool. Patrick, it's been a pleasure. That's your uh, pro tip of the week brought to you by Nate Wade Subaru. Hi, I'm Maddie. I work at Uinta Golf and I'm one of the shoe experts here. We're going to kind of go over basically what we have here in our stores. We have great options for everybody, every type of golfer, every level of experience. We have high-end shoes that are great for waterproofing. Echo is one of our best when it comes to quality most comfortable, definitely high-end leather. So it's definitely our highest price point here in our shop, but it's a big seller. We absolutely love these. We also sell women's golf shoes. This is definitely our most popular women's golf shoe right now this season. It's lightweight, colorful, goes with every outfit. We have a range of every golf shoe. We also sell some with the replaceable spikes. This is probably the biggest decision golfers make when they come in to buy golf shoes, whether they wanna go with more of a spikeless casual shoe or more of a traditional replaceable spike shoe. We definitely have a wide range of options for our customers and it makes it really helpful because then you can always find the perfect shoe for you. Golf for days in Heber Valley at one of five beautiful mountain courses. Wasatch Golf Course, Soldier Hollow Golf Course, and the Homestead Golf Club are all within seven miles of each other. Enjoy the feeling of getting away without the long drive.